Great. Uh, so we'll start. Uh, hello and good evening to everyone. This is Nayanika Datta from the Balipara Foundation and I am truly humbled to welcome you all to the fifth edition of the Naturenomics Dialogues 5.0. Uh, so the Balipara Foundation's Naturenomics approach seeks to demonstrate that conserving nature and restoring the environment can lead to economic growth and sustainable development uh, simultaneously. And uh, this year's theme is Back to Green Basics, where we're trying to have conversations centering the very basics uh, and the fundamentals of the environment, starting from land, water, communities, and uh, nature and um, and to also see the various uh, impacts that climate change has had on them and the ways that we can do to um, secure a sustainable future for all. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today and for giving us your time um, and we truly truly look forward to your insights. May I now hand it over uh, to our moderator for this evening Choki. Thank you so much for joining. You may now carry it forward. Uh, thank you, Nayanika, uh, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen joining us virtually today. Uh, I extend my warmest welcome to this important webinar where we deep dive into the crucial role women play in forest ecosystems and sustainable livelihoods. Uh, in many rural and indigenous communities, women are primary collectors of nanood forest products like fruits, nuts, and medicinal plants. Their deep knowledge and sustainable practices are vital for both conservation and community well-being. By supporting women through education, resources and decision-making opportunities, we can enhance their ability to manage forests sustainably and boost their economic independence. Now, may I have the privilege to introduce the speakers of the session who bring forth rich and uh, rich and diverse experience in the field of conservation. Uh, firstly, we have uh, Ma'am Usha Lachrumpa, who is a renowned environmentalist and has made significant contributions to Himalayan biodiversity con uh, conservation through wildlife research, habitat restoration, and sustainable development. Now retired, she serves as the state coordinator for the Indian Bird Conservation Network, co-authored important bird areas of Sikkim, and is a founding member of two uh, non-profit organizations. Her impactful work has earned her widespread recognition in environmental conservation. Our second speaker is Dr. Sangetuji, who is an accredited environmental research scientist and forester by Wet Assets Australia, specializing in terrestrial biodiversity conservation, conservation planning, and climate change adaptation in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, he is currently the technical director and program specialist at the Tarayana Foundation in Temple. And our last speaker is uh, Ma'am uh, Rabijita Lakhar, who is the Rural Futures Operations Architect at the Balipara Foundation in Assam. With extensive research uh, experience in habitat restoration and community development, she is an expert in child rights and environmental conservation. At the foundation, she leads various initiatives and field activities, demonstrating her dedication to sustainable development and community empowerment. Now, coming to the session, uh, this hour-long uh, webinar is divided into three sessions. Each speaker will get five minutes in each session. There will be a question and answer session at, towards the end. Now, to begin with, uh, we'll uh, go with Dr. Sange Doji. Uh, in your extensive research, research experience, this is the, to set the context, did you come across successful women-led uh, community-based forest management initiatives. In your observation, why do you think they are successful? Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you to Believe our Foundation for giving this uh, very, very uh, opportunity, a very important opportunity to talk and share about my experience in conservation, especially the forest and uh, involvement of women in the biodiversity conservation. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, uh, convey my regards and thank all the women around the world who actually plays a very crucial role, not only in the forest conservation, but I think every part of life, our life. So I want to thank everyone and also uh, hi to all the panelists here who are women as well. To get to the straight to the point about the uh, successful involvement of men. I would start with my uh, current uh, job responsibility and current uh, role that I play uh, as a technical director or the program specialist with the program uh, with the Tariana Foundation. Tariana Foundation, who uh, which was founded by 
Hamezi si bekun mada ajidojo mu onchuk chulis was struggling to actually help the the women and the the marginalized marginalized group of uh, people in the rural uh, Bhutan where like uh, people actually live in harmony with the nature i don't know if it is harmony or, or yeah, maybe we can discuss that later i mean a lot of women while i compete and all that stuff as well but then this is the also like uh, yeah so for the benefit of the women and marginalized group i think uh, i was uh, 20 years ago and i think uh, women w- were involved in planning all the biodiversity conservation and forestry conservation at all level at the grassroots level for instance uh, we have programs like on the the the, the social development where women are involved uh, for the social development and also economic development we have programs on the environment climate change and we also have a program on research and action uh, speak basically the action research the women are involved so and then uh, without forgetting the head of uh, uh, is were founded by women the uh, her role ha- uh, her ministry and also the head of our organization is a woman as well as we have uh, like more than 60% of the our colleagues as women who plays a crucial role in the forest and biodiversity conservation in Tarana foundation and also uh, some of the, my experience i used to work with the department of forest and park services before joining the Tarana foundation and uh, I used to work uh, extensively on the integrated conservation and development program and also the environment education in the national park where we began uh, it was like in the in the initial stage of the protective establishment in Bhutan where we did a lot of uh, social economy survey and participatory rural appraisal and by nature like uh, when we did this uh, planning and also i didn't find the problems and solutions in the national parks for the integrated conservation development program uh, most like i would say more than 80% or if not more uh, of the participants in the 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 planning and also the interviews and participants role uh, were women uh, rural appraisal were women so they played a very uh, crucial role in planning the national uh, uh, national parks uh, management plan as well as uh, implementing and monitoring the the, the ICDP programs in the national park also um, the women uh, actually like for instance uh, in the integrated conservation development we also st- established some some community uh, community forest where women were the president of the community forest and some women as uh, executive and also uh, we have uh, the other activities uh, like non wood forest projects and uh, management of course with the tarana also we have a lot of uh, involvement of women with the non wood forest projects because uh, like for instance the the recent uh, the projects on the dai the traditional conservation of traditional dai to uh, and also uh, training uh, upskill upskilling the skills to to produce more the traditional dai and also uh, provide economic opportunities for the women and um, as such uh, in the in the decision and policy level also in the forestry like we have women colleagues in the forestry as well as for the information i think i mean like we have uh, like for instance the, one of the cabinet minister the only cabinet minister is by background is a forester she was a forester and she plays a crucial role in the educating the business uh business uh, youth and women so uh women played a crucial role in the the all the all the levels uh so from the from the the my experience working with them to from the rural to the at the, the central and then also the policy and uh, at the uh, middle level so that's what i feel. thank you thank you doctor thank you for the insightful uh, perspective from your experience uh, you mentioned about the community forestry uh, in the botanic context while working for one of the stories in my uh, reporting days uh, i worked on a, a community forest story in the southern part of bhutan so there uh, in my reportage uh, i found that uh, women were not very keen or very confident to take up the leadership position 
as well. Like they cited various reasons, like the lack of training or lack of uh, education or many other reasons as such. So coming to Ma'am Rabijita, uh, uh, how does uh, Balipara Foundation encourage or uh, inspire women to take up leadership positions or, or generally uh, take up important decision-making positions uh, in your community-based forest management initiatives? Thank you, Choki. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening to my uh, other panelists. So I would uh, really would want to bring in the bring in what Choki you said during your uh, during the introduction of our uh, today's discussion is that how women are mostly engaged or involved in collection of FTFPs of firewood. And similarly, in our program, which is Rural Futures, which is basically a concept for, based on payment for ecosystem research services, where we uh, we work with the community along with uh, along with the whole community, and we, they work towards building a, a concept where they are engaged in restoration of the forest, and through the restoration of the forest, they are also also be provided with incentives, which can then they uplift their, them through through which they can actually achieve their universal basic sense. So where in that, it is true that we engage the whole community, which means we engage the whole entire households of that area, whoever is involved in that. And we also focus on engaging with uh, women, specifically understanding that uh, through our workshops that we do with the women, the gender workshops that we do, we actually understand that women who have not, uh, when you see as a part, you so how we have tried engaging with women is we have we want to they have started build, coming up with the leadership programs where they create their own group and through the SSGs they actually are engaging in the nurseries that uh, that we are doing or they are also coming up coming up and taking the roles of uh, supervisors which we have seen growing in the past years initially what we when we had started with which was as a program yes it was a uh, it was seen that the exposure visits that we do from one side to another, the exposure visits, the, in those visits, we could actually see involvement of men much more than women. But once we actually have engaged with the whole community and once the community have understood what Rural Futures does, the, uh, the payment of restoration process is, we have actually seen women coming up with their own ideas of building our nurseries. We have seen women uh, giving uh, indigenous, uh, uh, indigenous ideas about making surviving our uh, sapling. So one of the examples that I would like to cite is from Nagaland, where we have been working since 2022, and where we have the women who are youth of the village, and where and also it's 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 kind of uh, we we also have to understand that when we say youth most of the people they understand youth as the men of the villages who are between 18 to 35 but here we have seen two women who are youth of the village coming up from the from a very small village of Junebodo Sukhai and they are actually implementing the whole real futures model where they are uh, mobilizing the community uh, working with uh, 500 uh, planters and they are actually planting them thousand trees along with that they are managing the nursery that is going on there so in so when we say uh rural features when we say it involves a lot of hard work hard work and it, it was a lot of going on field and working on field it is a hands-on job but what happens in uh, what what we have seen uh, the trend that we have seen in the past years is that we have actually seen more and more women planters coming in to do the plantation, and the men uh, and the men uh, have also in the, uh, have the men. So it, the division of labor in the work is such is that the men would do the dugging, the pit pit boring, or the dugging of the uh, dugging or, or the, for the sapling to grow, and the women would actually plant the trees, uh, plant the saplings, and nurture them. And this we have also uh, we have got this insight from one of our workshops where so it has come out that the women of the community they are better at do uh, better at nurturing a sapling because they actually nurse nurture everything in their households so they this fine line between recognizing a, um, a household job as a job and then dip just diminishing that as something that uh, because it is not paid i think that there is that is something also where we have been able to make a difference where people have recognized that work that 
that a woman does in the household is not just it, it is also a full time job. So this so these are some some of the basic basic examples that I have so I have I want to share uh, at the start of the thank you. Thank you, Rabijit, for this uh, perspective from uh, Bali Para Foundation. Now I am very curious, uh, Ma'am Usha. Uh, this is a very personalized question. Uh, I a few years ago I used I was an active birder in the country I mean like uh due to many reasons I couldn't continue so as a state coordinator uh, for the bird network in the state coordinator as the state coordinator how do you see women participation in such activities like birding uh, culturally I think in this region uh, such activities are not taken up by uh, women they are you know uh, they are by many cultural reasons left to household chores so how do you see uh, young women or uh, now the women are changing this dialogue or the narrative and what is your observation when it you know uh, ensuring that there's environmental sustainability through such participation. First of all, I mean, uh, thanks to Balibara Foundation for holding this very important program. And everybody. Uh, I would like to add to that because, uh, as you have said, you know, uh, birding is one of the important aspects in the tourism initiatives that second, you know, with uh, almost 83% of the forest department. So it's a very big, uh, important initiative for many people. So uh, there we have, like, you know, we have a few examples where, you know, uh, uh, an independent woman is actually a set for murder. She has her own homestay and then she serves you know, really that people actually, actually serve demand from tourism that has actually encouraged this. Uh, it's not like the uh, inherent that you need to pick up with the murder. Though now the state is also giving a lot of emphasis on imparting training or, you know, bird guides and things like that. But uh, when you have tourists wanting to come and see, then we have the people who you know, they start as guides and then they start taking photographs and then they realize the value of the photograph and then when they see their pictures, they get very excited and then they learn more and they are self-taught then. You know, they need to look at the birds. Then they have started because Sikkim has been very progressive with homestay tourism. That so where you also are serving the local foods, you know, and showing off your local dress and your culture and traditions. So that is one of the important uh, way that women are actually slowly coming, not too many, because like you said, you know, many of them are not able to do this. But yes, we do have some shiny examples. Uh, but you know, you know, first I wanted to say that uh, you know, COVID and loss has actually made the people more self-reliant living there. And in, you would see say that you know, in Sikkim also, because of the loss, you know, we had the relation breakout just last year in October. That has cut off uh, washed away. So suddenly people are more reliant on their farmland. You know, the little farmland that they were actually growing from some time, I felt that, you know, People actually now realize the importance of growing their own food or, you know, the traditional knowledge that they have, making the local teas, you know, from uh, the local plants and uh, making, you know, earlier they used to have winter pits, we used to leave beef pits for potatoes and radish and they're, they're, you know, they, we still eat a lot of, you know, in Northeast also, a lot of dehydrated and so on food. Then we make a lot of herbal medicines. The child knows, you know, what to do if you have a nose cream, which is so this knowledge is there, you know, where even the government tried with you know, things like uh, home urban gardens. Initiatives are there, they didn't work out, but people are naturally tuned towards nature. And, uh, you know, they have sustainable foraging in the forests, where we have, you know, not just women, but entire they take their children and families to collect the wild edibles, you know, like mushrooms or arisima, you know, and uh, Hindu cardamine. You know, they, these are plants that are available and so So you are also doing a lot of this. So that is there. Having said that, even in the government sector, you know, we have the women and child development department where very young dynamic officers, you know, they are just using their roles to you know, dispense information regarding the plastic hazards in kitchens, you know, and what the, you know they can do about it. And the government's, you know, nice mission that uh, lifestyle for sustainable environment, that lifestyle for environment. That also talks a lot about uh, 
was live on nature and you know how to be more responsible and then we also have educated like independent uh, women entrepreneurs who are now you know, growing uh, since for the collection of yasabogi for the sepsis is quite uh, tough and time consuming we started you know growing in the lab so we have this for the sepsis in the tanis we grow in by independent women entrepreneur and another one more point last point i wanted to add was even in the veterinary field we find that women make really good veterinarians and so ethno veterinary knowledge you know they they, they are able to make decisions based on the naturally available medicinal products to heal and So these are some of the examples from my students. Uh, I would say they are not all in a successful women life, but they are uh, a lot of women. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, in continuation to that, uh, you mentioned about uh, how women are equally involved in the collection of the yarza gembu or the cordyceps fungi. So uh, this is from my experience. Uh, I had a reporting in my past year where I followed the women collectors as well as men and comparatively from my observation uh, it I I saw that I observed that women faced uh, Uh, comparatively much more challenges i mean their challenges are very huge compared to men like although the physical or the geographical challenges it, it is equally uh, same among them but uh, as a, a caregiver or as the main taking up main role role in the family as a caregiver i felt that uh, women had to bear the burden of uh, looking after the household taking care of Uh, their household in their absence and they had to arrange many other uh, measures to help that their uh, family survive or live when they are out of their house or when they're in the mountains picking up uh, cordyceps so um, in your uh, opinion what do you think are some of the reasons there are less women participation or what do you think are some of the barriers keeping uh, women from taking up activities in the conservation field which is Uh, i think in my opinion equally very uh, 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 equally uh, uh, very lucrative for both the uh, men, men and women well i mean i would like to say that uh, sikkim is that way more fortunate because uh, we have a very large women uh, you know population and everybody is deeply involved uh, as far as possible they are very independent and quite dynamic so we do have these issues of you know having to look after their own and part but also you have men participating in that like, especially if i can talk from my personal experience in in my in the village of lachon which is one of the few last few villages in north sikkim you find that the men are as good in the kitchen as the women and uh, if they equally share the burdens so i think the cross humanity as you know i see in the rest of the country also where women seem to be bearing a heavy on the yes our society is good. Yeah, so, but women have far more independence uh, to take up extra jobs, and they are far more vocal in the, the political arena as well. So that way, I think Sikkim is very fortunate. Uh, that's an unfortunate example from uh, Sikkim. So, to Ma'am uh, Ravijita, uh, uh, as an uh, NGO, work closely in the field with women. Uh, what do you think uh, are the challenges women face in accessing forest based economic opportunities and in your opinion what do you think uh, can how can these challenges uh, be effectively addressed yeah sorry i was on mute uh, thank you thank you so much shoki actually i would uh, i would actually think uh, congratulate usha ma'am that you, this is a really fortunate thing that uh, that we have heard and yes uh, the participation of women in our whole planters force like everywhere that we are working right now across northeastern states be uh, so currently we are working in manipur nagaland and uh, 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 arunachal and assam so arunachal project is comparatively new but the rest we have been working since the past 2 3 years so what what the one trend or the one thing that we have seen that when the women planters who are working on field uh, if i am a field planter from assam and i'm working right here uh, we you can see more than 50% participation like i said they mm-hmm. are very very uh, good at uh, doing their job when it comes to planting trees going in, into the forest and planting trees but when it comes to the exposure visits that we do or the exposure that we would want if uh, if we have started working in arunachal pradesh we would want the people from arunachal pradesh to come and see the work that has been happening in maybe nagaland in the last couple of years or in or maybe in assam from the last 5 years 
so during those opportunities women they miss out on those opportunities we see more men coming in and how does that, that does that happen it comes from what you said chunki that it because of the additional responsibilities that they have in their own households the responsibility of looking after their child responsibility of cooking the meals i think that is something that is mostly here be mostly they are dominated fortunately unfortunately we can't say but it is mostly dominated by women who are expected to those do those work uh, so when we actually did our field visits when we actually did our recce we also have the number of surveys where we ask people that who actually and also through our workshops when we ask them that who takes care of the households the women say that yeah we take care of the households we also do plantation like we are also doing household work and we are also going out and doing the plantation work and we are also working in our own agricultural field which means that uh, we are on the on the job we are working 24/7 the men would go out would do the same plantation we would do the same forest restoration would come home and would rest but at the same that if I, if if we come home and we feed us who is going to feed the family so that is a, that is a concept that i i I wish we get an exposure visit to Usha Ma'am's place and it's a given. We actually learn our men actually learn that after coming back home, uh, that is something that uh, can be bad managed. But uh, on the upside, I would also like to say that because the women have uh, started doing plantation on field, they have actually started interacting with more and more people from the same community. They have actually stepped in and becoming the supervisors of those work. So we have planters and then we have supervisors who supervise the planters in the whole. plantation program and the, because of women they have so much of knowledge uh, in this all these years so we have actually in the past one year we have seen the growth and and the participation of women as supervisors as more so that is something that i think is the gap and also we have seen a difference in that thank you uh thank you uh in continuation to what you said so i have a follow up uh, question or discussion which has spiked a curiosity in me so uh as you said uh mentioned uh, i think we all agree that financial empowerment alone is not enough for women and women need uh, more than anything policy support from the government and uh they need the decision making power so what kind of government or state policies should be in place to assure that women participate and lead initiatives at forest management so one typical example or scenario from the region is that mm, women are involved as primary collectors but if the venture is on a large or a, a large or a commercial scale it is usually their counterpart like you mentioned who will be taking decisions who will going who will be going to the training who will be also going to this uh, government uh, called meetings and workshops so how do you think the government can somehow ease these policies and make it an enabling environment for women as well thank you thank you for your question yeah i think Uh, what uh, the policies at the level of policies what can be done is that we can start off with the basics uh, uh, like if i if we are traveling and uh, there are a lot of things when it comes to about our hygiene and safety right so maybe uh, some of the women they are also not very much they, like if i let us not even if we not talk about the planters that they that there are we can talk about the travel that the extensive travel that i as a, a conservationist or i who am working with pali performed in i do and when it comes to traveling for like from guwahati if i have to go to nagaland if i have to go by road i have to travel for 8 to 10 hours and there sadly there are very there is very less facility of uh, washrooms and toilets for in the road and there are and it, and it's the same way for people who are working on field like if, if women are collecting firewood or, or they are engaged in uh, in plantation and they are in a island island landscape or in a hilly forest area where you will not get that fac- facility so maybe start at the at the very basic and i would uh, this would not be something that uh, which will happen uh, happen at the a uh, national level but it can also start at the local levels from the mlas and all of that so maybe approaching those people uh, ensuring about the safety of women when they uh, they, uh, they are engaged in any kind of activities as such so so that those kinds of discussion i think we should be it should be more into uh, policies and when it comes to uh, the larger discussions it can always come into the discussions that happen in our parliament where we can actually see the speakers who are appointed 
uh, be it environmental, environmental or minister, or be it, the, be it any other ministers, most of them are seen uh, as dominated by men. So maybe when it comes to uh, selecting all of all of the people who will be the voice of the people, who will represent the community or who will represent the uh, whole uh, nation, it should be more. It should it, it should not weigh into just one gender. What I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Sanghi, uh, Tarayana Foundation works uh, on the ground with uh, real people in the real field. Uh, in your opinion, uh, how can cross-sectoral collaboration with the government, NGOs and local communities better support uh, women's involvement in forest-based livelihoods and decision-making processes? Uh, if you uh, can cite uh, real-time examples from Tarayana Foundation's uh, initiatives, this would be very helpful for us to understand. Thank you once again. Uh, I think uh, since this topic topic of the dialogue is about the basics. I think I'll start with the basics of like uh, the Jumaji, four elements, very important elements of for our survival. I think is uh, like water, fire, land, and uh, air. And uh, uh, with the Tarayana Foundation, so, uh, as I was saying, like uh, we actually, the Tarayana Foundation was established by the Queen Mother 20 years ago, two decades ago, to actually support, uh, support the, the people, uh, the disadvantaged poor people in the rural town who doesn't have actually access to resources, access to education, and access to good housing. So uh, so I think, uh, for instance, the, when you talk about the basics of four elements, uh, if you don't have four elements in place, I think uh, if you, like people doesn't have access to the water, so like we do currently do a lot of uh, spring shade uh, management, spring shade uh, revival, uh, because uh, people need to have access to spring water for for drinking, for health purpose, and for for irrigation, for food. And so this is one of the examples that we uh, go at the at the ground level to to help people. Uh, of course, I just I'm just I've just joined two months ago, but then still, like uh, to my understanding, there are a lot of uh, good things happening here, and also we do a lot of like land management, so and then also forestations and uh, and also uh, also do a lot of uh, women upskilling upskilling the women uh, as I was saying earlier. So uh, and then one. One of the issues uh, like men have, as we discussed earlier by the other 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 panelists, uh, is uh, access to resources. I think, uh, yeah, access to resources from like uh, saying from the water here yeah, or thing, but also access to resources in terms of monetary access to resources. Uh, and Tariana Foundation has a micro microfinance bank, establish a microfinance bank uh, uh, under the uh, guidance of uh, the our Majesty. So uh, provide uh, access. To women, especially to women, for uh, to uh, uh, get access to like uh, um, agriculture or the uh, the, the other uh, basic uh, necessity things. So, so these are some of the important things. Also, I think uh, from the other angle, I think we also uh, do a lot of uh, capacity development and uh, education. From the Tariana Foundation, provide uh, the scholarships for. The disadvantaged, uh, the poor rural students, especially women, and also uh, and also do a lot of uh, capacity in like friendship management or leadership, and then also provide uh, yeah, resources so we uh, uh, garner resources to support those uh, people, and also uh, uh, at sometimes like uh, at. Uh, in some places, like uh, for instance, for housing, like uh, there are people without uh, good housing, and I think uh, this is further um, worsened by the the impact of the climate change. Uh, you know that when talking about forest, the climate change is uh, impacting the livelihood, the biodiversity, everything. So to help those uh, rural poor people, we also provide uh, uh, help to provide the, the basic. Uh, the housing, uh, which is one of the main uh, main program that uh, takes uh, to support the uh, rural people with the with the housing program, and then there are a lot of other uh, other activities that we get to the 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 ground or basic level. So and then probably 
for invest all the time to wrap up. I think uh, women, uh, men of one of the main focus is on women and children. Uh, they, they, they are marginalized group of people in Bhutan. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Ushun, ma'am, uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, in the two uh, non NGOs that uh, you are a founding member of, and even in the uh, bird birding network, there is a uh, you know targeted education or training capacity development training and uh, initiatives like where they have uh, uh, opportunities to develop their skills. So, how do you think? Uh, the women can take uh, on more impactful roles in forest ecosystem management and associated sustainable livelihood opportunities. First of all, you know, I like to just say that when we talk about women, I can equate them with marginalized and equate them with uh, disadvantage, you know, there itself we are like kind of hurting ourselves. So that is a narrative that I think we need to really that is a can. Yes, I mean, it's a fact. But then, you know, if we say that, then it does kind of put us in you know, a kind of inferior position where it is very difficult to be on the you know, up, uh, coming field. Because we always make this advantage. You know, always want to take things out of the doctors and we have to reach out and help you. Like, you know, we are so hopeless. So, that kind of narrative is, we can change you know, with these initiatives. I, I, I mean, I, we are talking like very rosy uh, pictures here. You know? And we really look to the Bhutan with the Bhutan has put such wonderful initiatives. And we wish the rest of the country also in India would actually you know, take up some of those. And in having said that, we find that when we are talking about women and flowers and all that, we find more and more people actually leaving in those ecosystems. You know? Yes, the fact is there that you know, we have the daily poor, people who stay behind, you have to do all the drudgery of the work and uh, you know, work in the field and work in the forest. But even, I mean, if you look at it, we find more and more people are sending their children to school, and then they are migrating as, you know, especially from the Northeast, a lot of young uh, women leave, are leaving the states to work in other places, either in the talent sector or the TV sector or in many other sectors. Many of them are, you know, I find that from Northeast, a huge contingent of ladies, maybe Nagaland and not, you know, actually becoming IFS, IAS officers and really actually in a way, in a way distancing themselves from the forest ecosystem. So that is another thing, you know, we're talking about really grassroots, you know, and we're talking about safe, you know, we're talking about public toilets and, you know, the women and then in schools, you know, the many of the girls, you know, girls don't even have a good toilets in their own schools. So we have in, along with the government NGOs also focused on you know, starting out that issue. But it's a kind of, you know, I feel it's a kind of multiple uh, level, I think, think thought process should be taken up on this. And you know, we can't you know, just say only forest, because when you talk about the people who are really marginalized, then, you know, you are talking of a perception of poverty. That is something that I've seen really uh, way too much in a place like Sikkim, where you feel that if you're not living up to medical standards, or you're not carrying around standards, then you are good. So there is a huge perception of poverty. I would say it's like an intellectual poverty. You know, sorry to say that. But uh, we have that. So I feel, you know, when you're talking about birding tourism, people tourism, what is it? You know, it is likely to be tourism that is happening in all states. We have to make it ecologically sustainable, ecologically you know, friendly, so that you know, it becomes you. So birding, and having said that, you know, if you find that, yes, where the training has been given, not really many people will go back with a certificate and become a certified workers. It will take a long time. It's not uh, going to be easy, it's not going to be fast, but uh, it's a hope that we can make this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I think uh, the discussions till now has been more about uh, going back to the grassroots, empowering women uh, at uh, uh, certain instances, empowering them by providing them the basic uh, like free housing and access to resources like uh, safe drinking water and sanitation. Uh, but uh, this kind of initiatives, once uh, provided, they are not so lo long lasting. I mean, like after a while, people tend to go back to that place from where they started. So I think uh, to strengthen this such initiatives, I mean, to make it more impactful, we need uh, participat uh, participatory governance st structures. So how do we uh, ensure that through these participatory govern governance structures, 
people have uh, an equal access to resources and decision making in forest management or in conservation so that they have this sense of ownership like they don't have to be have this freeloader mindset like oh everything will be provided by the government but they need to have this community sense of ownership so how do we do that in your area yeah so i was talking about how this uh, uh the discussion has been about going back to the basics of providing uh, free housing uh, sanitation and water to the people so after a while you know although these facilities are provided if we don't empower them to uh, to own it it tends to go back to often to the square one where they started so i'm asking how uh, the with the support of the participatory governance structures we can ensure an equal access to resources and decision making so that they have the ownership of the resources provided thank you so much for your question uh, this actually uh, brings back to a quite a interesting case story that uh, had happened in one of our uh, intervention villages in balipara so this village is in uh, in it, it, it's a forest fringe village so forest fringe village means like they live by the forest that they it, the, the, where they live by is palipa reserve forest so reserve forest area so this uh, community uh, that they live it's an indigenous community and then they uh, they did not have any basic assets of uh, electricity uh, if, uh, the connect uh, connectivity to the main 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 stay uh, down and uh, the, uh, schools and uh, they didn't have anything so what they started what they realized is that why nothing is reaching to them it's because of majorly the connectivity to the mainland so the the uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah can you hear me now yes yeah so they had to cross a tiny stream to reach uh, the village so that is uh, that was one of the major issue and the uh, stream uh, and during uh, rainy days it would get uh, over flooded and it would become a river and so and the bridge that connected the village to the mainland was broken they had written number of applications to the local panchayat they had even gone to the block level but the situation wasn't getting any better so through our restoration program what ha- how what happens is that there are three sets of restoration three sets of income generation that happens in the community first is through forest restoration of course and then there is another through uh, nursery management so in nursery management uh, the whole community uh, they uh, they come up with the plan of building up a nursery uh, they, and their products products of this of that nursery is being sold to uh, be bali professional or any other vendor that they can approach to and then they decide on how to utilize that money on what to do about that money so we have seen instances of uh, one village where people were so much they had given up on the on uh, on like you you said that on receiving or waiting for facilities to reach them then they took it on themselves to build a bamboo bridge for themselves so they what they did the, the whole community did uh, got together and they built a bridge which is again one of the so that they can actually access to it can be a easy it can it can be a access to the village and also it can also ensure that the, uh, the primary level teacher who was not being able to reach the village during uh, monsoons would come to the village to teach the student and uh, gradually it also ensured that people are actually moving out of the village so things like this actually like when you said about participation or uh, ownership like this is how i think we can ensure that the people who we are working with like all of us uh, in this panel are actually working with community so till the time there is a hand holding process they will rely on you but after a while we will have to make sure that this participation goes into more of ownership they would they should realize that this is our land this is our land that we are restoring this is our food that we will get the produce of this land we will uh, will be ours the produce of this nursery we can utilize is better to actually access universal basic assets so things like that we it can actually maybe uh, bridge the gap uh, of such uh, problems if not uh, diminish it thank you thank you uh, thank you rabijit uh, uh, dr sange uh, tarayana foundation i think also works uh, closely with the lo- local government counterparts in the country uh, uh, 
in the initiatives that Tarayana Foundation take. Uh, there, I saw many engagement of the local government leaders. So uh, in the initiatives uh, of the foundation, how do the found how does the foundation ensure that uh, there is participation from the local government as well? I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, I think uh, when you talk about the participation and the sustainability of the programs that we implement, I think uh, not only the experience from Tariana, I'll just narrate the uh, experience we're working with the national parks and uh, the uh, protectors. Uh, uh, I think uh, we actually term in the communication, the extension, when we study, like we term people with uh, uh, two... Uh, terminologies as a logat who doesn't actually accept the innovation and then also innovative some in some part of the villages or some part of the uh, the community group it's very difficult to convince people and implement uh, the programs that is sustainable so that becomes the issue like people have their own customary rights or, i mean like customary uh, the the thinking or attitude and also their own rules which actually Actually, bars people from the, 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 the people bars from accepting the new innovations, but also some some areas people have like a very uh, accept resist resilient to the accepting the the innovation new innovation that government or the foundation bring. So I think uh, in terms of uh, engagement with the local communities, I think I mean like we as a Tarena, also in the national parks, I think we work with the through the network of the the field officers. We have the field officers who work and closely with the local communities and the local leaders uh, who are actively involved in planning, prioritizing the activities, and uh, also monitoring the activities. But sometimes, as I was saying, the sustainability is a issue. So in some cases, like uh, when we worked with the national parks, I think. Uh, what we do is uh, some activities like supply of CGI sheet, the corrugated uh, roofing materials. Uh, we do a co sharing so that people uh, uh, pay some uh, minimum amount, like 20% or 30%. Uh, if they are inside the property area, then pay uh, 20%. Then outside or in the boundary buffer zone, then they pay 30%. So, like, uh, unlike uh, national parks and elsewhere, we have people inside and outside the national parks. So, uh, this this modality sometimes works, but sometimes you know, like uh, for instance, uh, sustainability is a problem. For instance, the the compensation program, the tiger compensation programs, or some compensation program wasn't successful because uh, because of a lot of uh, the issues with the sustainability, and uh, uh, sometimes when we plan that the activities, when we act actively involve the local communities in planning and also understanding the local issues uh, and uh, uh, working closely with them. For instance, when I work with the Trumshinla National Park, in, uh, Trumshinla National Park in the central Bhutan, which is a very important uh, habitat for red pandas. And there was a lot of, uh, lot of logging, logging in the, the red panda key habitat areas. And then we worked with the community to establish the community forest and in partnership with the local government. So, and then, then we established the community so that the resource rights and the people, because the issue was the people, the outside users, the people from outside comes to get the timber. So when we work with them, so then uh, we, after starting the community forest, then the, the outside users could, couldn't really uh, get access, but then they can uh, get access from other part of the other part of the area, but not from that critical red panda habitat, uh, which is now under the, the the core zone. So, and then that's a sustainable, and then we could later see a uh, uh, boom in the 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 red panda habitat, and then also yeah, also conservation. So. Uh, and then similar with the Tarayana Foundation, so we, uh, for any activities that we plan, so uh, of course we, I mean like, uh, we work closely with uh, with the communities, understanding their, their issues and their uh, current status and uh, difficulty they face. As I was saying, like, sometimes we say, Bhutan people live in harmony with nature, but then sometimes in some cases, like or most cases, it is other way because we don't see the real film practical. So I think uh, this is the issue that we uh, try to handle.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, what is your experience, Ma'am Usha? <laughs> Uh, not so clear. Even now, not so clear? No. <laughs> what about now? Mm. Is it better? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll talk from my phone itself. Uh, yeah, I mean, as you said, you know, that people have now got so accustomed to this government largest, you know, become dependent. It's very difficult for them to leave that and adapt, uh, you know, to take ownership because they find that. You know, it's easier to just let go and uh, maybe the government will come up with a new scheme and uh, that would be, you know, more, make life easier for them. So, unfortunately, that is making us, you know, you know the reality is that it's making us more dependent and we've lost our independence to really thinking and doing a lot. But having recognized that, we find that the community does I think, realize this importance of not really relying too much on the government. So then you have all these new, you know, entrepreneurship and all coming up, where the emphasis on is not on too much dependence on the you know, government largesse. So here I would like to, I'm not sure if this is the right time to point out, but you know, the way we do education, that perhaps needs another mindset change. Because your education is limited to academics. So there we find that, you know, so we are taught, we are teaching our children things, we are teaching our children languages, we are teaching our children what is not really going to help them once they come out of school. Unless, you know, they have few right ones to take the initiative and come out and, uh, you know, make a name for themselves. So, you find that these are these sparks of intelligence, you know, that uh, you come across in social media, you know, in your government uh, newspapers. So, that is there, you know, that, you know, Somewhere where we can come to a compromise where, you know, you are living off the government largesse at the same time, maybe you are learning not to make it a permanent feature of your life. For so example, we have, like in Sikkim, we have the Rural Management Development Department, where the director is a lady, very dynamic lady, and has collaborated or has taken on, uh, you know, the, another lady who has got vast uh, experience in zero waste and uh, sustainable lifestyle. So we have this initiative called Zero Waste Himalaya, of which you all also must surely be a part of. Where we are trying our best to see that, you know, that Swaj Bharat Mission and things like that are, you know, making a practical comeback. So that kind of uh, mindset, if we can start off with the schools itself, you know, our textbooks, you know, the way our teachers teach, it's, it's a huge thing. Sikkim is trying its best. And we hope that this dependence on government uh, reduces to a level that you are not a burden on the government. And you are no longer, you know, feeling helpless and feeling like, you know, some kind of parasite. So that, that is a mindset that we have to bring in. And I think when women are involved, it is much more uh, easy. Because as you've discussed before, you know, we have even in the government, we have a lot of women panchayats, all the self help groups are women led. All the things they are doing are something to do with, uh, you know, what women can achieve. So the, the thought processes are in the right direction, but somewhere we need to step up and just not make it, you know, leave it all to the top. I hope that is. Thank you. Thank you so much for the perspective shared here. Uh, so this is the end of our session today. So we will open for question and answer session from our attendees online. So uh, the question here is from an anonymous attendee. So the question is, how women's narratives around environmental conservation can be better represented? How can women's narratives around environmental conservation be better represented? So I think this is a question to anyone who has the answer. Uh, I can just add a little bit that, you know, the government initiatives we have in two, two I mentioned in the uh, One is that Mero, Mero Santati where, you know, every, every new mother in her oh. name, like, you know, 100 chaplains are planted. So I don't know how feasible or how uh, lasting it's going to be because Sikkim already has 83% or other 
more than 40 percent is under forest cover. So that uh, you know, the rest of it is under the forest department. So it is like high altitude areas, border areas where you don't really have too much of. Uh, I would say ownership in reality, but just a thing. That is where Nero, Nero Sector is a very important program for government. And then there is a tree plantation for your mother. So these kind of initiatives are a start. So I wouldn't call them really lit. And we have, you know, even in the forest department itself, we have various levels, right from the lowest level to the highest level. You have women foresters who have very responsible positions. And they are in contact with the joint forest management committees with eco-development committees around our protected areas and with the biodiversity management committees which are really, really important for protecting traditional knowledge and protecting the intellectual property rights or regarding our food resources or medicinal plant resources. So these these are the positives that we need to look at and updating of our textbooks, you know, to be very environmental focused because our next generation is losing touch with their roots, which we have to recognize and acknowledge. You know, we have where children are afraid of uh, leeches or you know, afraid of caterpillars or spiders. You know, it's it's not very worrying. You know. So skill development are actually, you know, if we can make it more accessible, not just after the school uh, education is over, but if we can bring it down to primary and secondary school level, where, you know, our young minds are actually more reliable and receptive. And as for their talents, you know, they can be uh, involved in becoming more responsible no environmentally conscious citizens. I'm not sure huh? if I have said more than what was asked. Anyone wants to add on to what Mamusha said? Um, actually, I didn't hear your question properly. I just went offline. So yeah, this is uh, just repeat. Yeah, yeah. So the question is like how uh, women-led conservation activities can be better representative than narratives around this uh, initiatives. I think I mean like uh, to. Add to what Madam Usha said, I think uh, from Bhutan and Bhutan perspective, uh, like for instance, uh, when I work with the national park, so I'm like the government that I think uh, the women led some some activities like for instance the the handloom, the you the which like the, the Tarena Foundation is currently doing is uh, basically uh, focus on mainly on the women who uh, for the uh, livelihood uh, yeah, development also and uh, also to upskill up and also culturally conserve the uh, cultural and traditional knowledge. So uh, similarly, there are a lot of uh, activities like uh, the watershed management, the land, the SLM, the, the land management, the sustainable land development and uh, all these projects, uh, uh, activities that uh, actually support the livelihood uh, of the women because uh, as I was saying, like, uh, if the four elements of uh, the any of the four elements to come to the basics and then for instance uh, lack of water sufficient water or adequate water would actually affect the women most in the man because they have to uh, uh, women have to mostly like cook or they just uh, have to uh, uh, feed the family too. so I think uh, women uh, the, the workload of, to the women uh, increases if they settle so I think uh, I mean like uh, from this perspective like uh, helping the uh, revival of springs and under the climate change all these uh, activities actually supports the women so that uh, uh, they can have more time for livelihood development or other activities and and also, like uh, then uh, with the integrated conservation development programs, like uh, in supporting the the and the remote villages supply of uh, the supply of the solar lightings to uh, to the rural communities, so that they they can work in the, at night when there there is no because they don't have uh, access to electricity in the past. So of course now we have uh, almost 100 percent access to electricity, but then I think in the past we didn't have uh, access to electricity but the supply of solar lightings to the communities uh, uh, household increase the, the the working hours uh, which actually help them to uh, generate more income and uh, support their families so these are some of the activities that uh, women that uh, activities uh, can uh, help in the uh, sustainable management of forests. Ma'am Rabijit, so you want to add anything? 
yeah uh, i would like to uh, say that yes uh, we are better than how we were in, uh, in our earlier days like we can see uh, women coming up we can see we've been participating in local panchayats and everything but uh, it also uh, is something that uh, like there is another question that i see like uh, which is about the decision making process like we can we can actually see that women are included like how when we say that people, uh, women are being are in the local panchayats right are in are participating or are a member of the local panchayats but how many women are actually making the decisions on their own how many women are actually not influenced by any other men in their uh, in the society or in their family or, or things like that how many uh, so things like when we uh, talk about uh, giving opportunities it should be mostly should be women led like in here how we see like the ssgs are run by women the these these kind of programs where women are actually participating through and through from end to uh, from top to end in all the uh, uh, in all the program would ensure that they they get the exposure which from all these years uh, they might have been missing they get there should be equal opportunities of trainings and workshops where the gender trainings and now we actually can say that there are a lot of training programs which focus focuses on based specifically on gender and by gender i don't, don't only mean that it has to be trained the women has to be trained it should be both and uh, through that perspective actually we can actually bring in we can actually see and there there should be a dialogue between men and women like we are having right now where we can actually see both perspective uh, perspectives coming and both narratives being shown so equal opportunities for sure uh and the rest of this we have already covered if i may i, I think that to the first uh, question i can add a few ex- uh few experience from my uh, working in the media for the past few years so i think regarding how uh, women's narratives around environmental conservation can be better represented uh, in my experience i think in our societies we often tend to when we go into the field we directly tend to question or we interview male counterparts and due to many reasons like cultural and social reasons uh, as a reporter while going into the ground we don't always try to interview uh, women so it's always like the mindset is the men will speak better so this is from my personal experience like uh, if we are to meet a woman or ask her some questions we have to go into the field with that mindset okay i want to meet some women and interview them so i think it is uh, the build up of how we are uh, uh, i mean uh, built up as a child or growing up growing up in into this patriarchal so so society so first thing uh, we can do is like uh, for better representation it's always the stories are, are are always better when we go into the field so unless you experience or get to live their lives we don't really know what that field is so i think organizations come here like you can release a, a press briefs or something on your social media and the reporter or someone have to like they have to engage try to engage and then get into connection so also uh, in my experience i feel that uh, we need funding opportunities here so if possible the organizations can keep some uh, communication grants uh, available for this reporter so that they can go into the field and then really feel this initiatives for themselves and write very uh, female led or narratives be represented in the in the society yeah i think uh, you have said uh, beautifully choki we have to have those narratives like i was also oh, this is this comes from something that i have also witnessed uh, we have whatever like not and I, this is like I've, we have also worked in other organizations where whenever there is a movie being made or there is a or they, you have to show a initiative of a person who is doing good on in field who you have to who the organization had they have to represent at a larger audience and somehow it always ends up being a man so maybe changing that perspective even at the higher level and not only is looking at the you know the field narratives might change things uh, we have no new questions so should we wait for some time nanika and you know i would like to say that <laughs> alipara itself is doing so much in highlighting you know, women in this field so you know we need probably you know more uh, 
exposure or more people who have you know enjoyed like, this kind of sitting back and forth. I'm sure there are other organizations also doing. Now with the you know advent of social media so much and it's not there during my time. But now it's far more easy to show this uh, side you know, on social media and all other forms of you know, communication where whether you know you would like to uh, you would like to be uh, you know, a part of it progress um sorry i got cut off this now someone promoted me to panelist and that is why i couldn't have to rejoin uh-huh. okay. ma'am you joined from a different id i guess so i just saw that and then i again sent you another panelist request thank you thank you <laughs> okay no problem yeah communication issues you know are a little technically or digitally yeah. challenged <laughs> so i'm sorry about that but that's what you know i was uh, wondering how we could make this uh, more accessible to people through social media about how well you know organizations like balipara are, are recognizing women and making sure that you know people hear about them and they are good deeds So we have many many people in all almost all the northeastern states including sikkim who are very vocal at the uh, village level at panchayat level at the government level and those are the women whom if we keep on highlighting and recognizing their achievements we'll have i think a more positive feedback isn't it thank you ma'am uh, so we have another question uh, so it reads uh, we know the concept of nimble fingers how women are understood to be better pluckers of tea leaves because of their nimble fingers Are there more examples of how women can add something to conservation that men cannot? Anyone can share your experience if you have any. So how uh, can women add something to conservation that men cannot? Uh, I think uh, it's not like uh, men cannot. But here, uh, the nimble fingers reminds me of a uh, thing that one of our planters, uh, they said. Uh, and it was it came from a male like a man like male planter that that person said that uh, if we are on field like he he uh, he recognized the importance and the care and uh, work that women on field do because when we say that we are we are working on field there is labor it is about almost recognized as the men that are doing the labor but he himself said that if without this women planters we wouldn't have been able to even plant one sapling because they are so much better or they have so much more patience patience there is a i think there is a echo yeah there's echo so is it Usha, ma'am, uh, just put on mute. Like one of the devices can go on mute so that it, if uh, you know, the sound doesn't echo. So, uh, that person he said that it is uh, the 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 women they have they have such nurturing role, that and they have so much dedicated to something that they do. Uh, it is much more they add much more value to conservation than we can, that we can ever do. we are good at dug, digging pits or we are good at maybe building houses and all when it when it comes to conservation or when it comes to actually planting a sapling and caring for that sapling because once you, it's very easy for someone to uh, cut off a tree because you don't know you have you don't realize how many years it has been uh, since the tree has grown but it is equally much difficult to see one of your own sapling die so and and it and as a woman because they also have this motherly instinct and they have also grown uh, in a households where obviously it's again comes back to the mindset mindset and mentality that all of us have grown into they are into nurturing and care so that is something that had come from the field perspective that is something that one of our own planters said so that was very interesting to hear and uh, in, in likewise in one of the areas that we have worked one of the women planter they they were they had worked in that area and they had actually stopped miners from entering the miners would illegal wood loggers from entering the villages and uh, they had actually stopped a deforestation and soil mining in that area so once it actually starts from the basic but with the exposure and training they can actually achieve much more thank you <clears throat> So do we wait for some more questions? We can wrap this up now. Uh Choki, it's it's going to be 6:50. I think we are on time and yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh so I want to thank all the panel members here for your uh insightful perspectives and bringing into many stories that are unheard of in the region. 
And thank you so much for your time. Now, now I hand it over to Nayanika. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so, dear speakers, uh, with this, I would like to close today's uh, session. But, uh, I mean, uh, special thanks and gratitude to the panel, uh, panelists and all the people who have joined our session today and have given the time to sort of listen to this discussion and share their own questions and perspectives on it. And thank you for such a diverse array of case stories from your field experiences and beyond. Uh, we have always talked about conservation, but to represent the women's perspective in uh, in like the various narratives of conversations uh, is not uh, has never been a part of the main discourse so I think it's uh, a very special uh, and a very important discussion that we had today and thank you so much for your contributions uh, but uh, like I had also mentioned in the pre-call today that um, a special mention would go to Dr. Sange because uh, no discussion on women's issue would ever be sort of complete without a man's perspective. And thank you for joining in the fact that our panel today has become a lot more inclusive and diverse because you have joined. So thank you. Um, and um, so, I mean, before I wind up, I just want to thank Choki for uh, being such a smooth moderator to this session today. Due to some last minute miscommunication, I <laughs> missed introducing her, for her, but I must, uh, you know, just let everyone know that uh, Choki feels like a, you know, uh, member of the Balipara Foundation itself because uh, she had been the winner of uh, the Green Journalist Award last year at the Balipara Foundation Awards. Uh, so uh, besides all the professional accomplishments uh, that she has had, uh, she has been uh, very uh, sort of our very own and has contributed a lot to this uh, panel today. And uh, thank you so much. With this, I would like to close the session. And we have another one. And uh, the digital dialogues for this season ends tomorrow. Uh, with this, I would also like to uh, let you know that I'll be sharing a report with like a set of, uh, uh, I mean, the main discussion points and the set of recommendations. Would we'll seek your feedback on the same. And thank you so much for joining. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Rabi Jita, for a thank you. Thank you. Part of this, and thanks. Thank I must thank Karishma. She is also in the call. I think um, the fact that she's you know helped me sort of build a network with Usha, ma'am, today, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. It was wonderful meeting you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.